Hello everyone, my name is Gerrit Wilfi. I'm the head of the Applied Geophysics Group at the Institute of Mind Seismology, and I'm also a senior adjunct researcher at the Center for Ore Deposits and Earth Sciences at the University of Tasmania. This is a talk I gave a few weeks ago at the AETC conference on the role of passive seismic imaging in mineral exploration. Before I start with the technical details, I'd like to give a brief introduction on the Institute of Mind Seismology. As the name suggests, we work on recording and interpreting the, the, res the response of the rock mass to mineral extraction. We developed the, the hardware, the software, and the techniques to analyze the seismic data recorded by these systems. We have more than 250 operational seismic systems in 38 countries, which is roughly 60% global market share. And although the primary objective of the Institute of Mine Seismology is to monitor mining-induced earthquakes for safety for mine design and for support design purposes we established a new group called the applied geophysics group in 2014 and the focus of this group was to adapt um, passive seismic imaging methods from crustal seismology to use in the um, mining industry for non-conventional monitoring and for imaging initially due to our customer base we used these methods mostly for geotechnical applications such as these shown in the bottom two figures the bottom left we see an application where the method was used to image mined out and intact slopes in a historic mining town in New South Wales, whereas the bottom right figure shows how we can image the phreatic surface and seepage pathways inside the tailing storage, tailing storage facility. Our focus shifted a couple of years ago from using this method for geotechnical applications to mineral exploration, in part due to the challenge that we face in the exploration industry um, these days. As the world transitions from fossil fuels to renewable energy, we will need a lot more raw material to supply, especially the battery, to produce the batteries needed as we um, electrify the global transportation fleet. For instance, a battery electric vehicle contains nearly four times as much copper as its internal combustion counterpart. As you can see from the top right um, charts, the amount of copper, lithium, cobalt, and also nickel that we're currently producing is able to meet the demand. But even relatively pessimistic models suggest that within five years, the amount of raw material that we could produce will be much less than what it will be required. So even though there's a clear incentive for us to find more raw material, the, the average cost per discovery is rising, as you can see from the bottom left figure. And also the estimated value of the resources where we are discovering is declining. And this is despite the fact that the commodity prices have slowly been increasing. So what this means is that we're spending more money and finding less resources. Now, this is not a scaling indictment on the exploration industry. And in fact, if you attended AEGC a few weeks ago, you would have seen that there's lots of innovation happening in the space. But instead, what it means is that the easy to find and easy to extract uh, resources have been depleted and we're increasingly needing to look deeper and mine deeper to supply the material that we need. So geophysics has an important role to play and has played an important role over the last few decades in um, exploration. And typically how this is done is by conducting regional geophysical surveys such as uh, gravimetric or magnetic surveys um, to identify anomalies or targets. Um, it's then followed by a long and expensive drill campaign um, to try and detect or discover, to, to discover, uh, make a discovery, but then also to delineate the discovery and, and lead to a resource estimate. A nice example of this is shown here in the Madrid Volcanics in Northwest Tasmania, where the polymetallic VMS Helier deposit has a clear gravity anomaly associated with the deposit. And also the Mount Bischoff tin mine has a, a deposit has a, a magnetic anomaly associated with it. You can see for both these anomalies, there's been a significant amount of drilling um, accompanying it. But in this region between them, there's almost no drilling being conducted, even though clearly this is a very prospective region. And this is because this area is hidden by a barren tertiary basalt. Um, this, this tertiary basalt is dense and it is high, has high magnetic susceptibility. So variations in the paleotopography, paleotopography of the basalt um, results in um, gravity anomalies that are 
not associated with dense material below the basalt, but instead in the variations of the paleotopography. And similarly, because the basalt is, has high, um, high magnetic susceptibility, a similar thing happens. So if we want to explore below, below barren cover, we need to use new geophysical methods that do well for deep low surface. And this is where passive seismic imaging can play a role. What do I mean when I talk about passive seismic imaging? Well, specifically, I'm referring to ambient seismic noise demography. Typically, seismic noise has been seen as a nuisance that hides useful signals such as those from earthquakes and active sources. But over the last two decades or so, seismologists have discovered that we can use this seismic noise in itself to image the subsurface. The frequency of the seismic noise we consider, um, or the origin of the seismic noise we want to consider, depends on the frequency content. For instance, at low frequencies, below 1 hertz, the seismic noise wave field is dominated by the oceanic microseism, which is the uh, results from the interaction of the ocean income of the ocean tide with the solid earth. Whereas at higher frequencies, above 1 hertz, for instance, the anthropogenic activity dominates the seismic uh, noise wave field. So uh, sources such as trains or traffic or industrial activity generates most of the seismic noise at these frequencies. Now, because the oceanic microseism provides this stable seismic noise wave field, most of the ambient noise tomography applications in literature are um, relate to regional or tectonic scale um, imaging projects. Um, but in recent years, there's been several studies where the method has been used in a much smaller scale and utilizing much higher frequency noise. One of the pioneering data sets in this regard has been the Long Beach Array, where more than 5,000 geophones was placed in urban um, Long Beach in California. And uh, the, mostly the traffic here was used to image sections of the San Andreas Fault. Another reason why this method has become popular on a smaller scale is because of the advent of nodal geophones. So these geophones are compact, wireless, robust, and very sensitive and autonomous. So they can, rec they can record data for a month or so. Um, and because of their low cost, it now enables us to deploy stations, hundreds or thousands of stations at low cost. So for the first time in the industry, we can deploy very dense seismic arrays at low cost. At the same time, also due to the increase in computational power and uh, decrease in storage cost, we can now pro easily process these terabytes of data that are generated from these surveys. So as you can see from this, uh, uh, graph at the bottom, the amount of publications in the field of ambient noise uh, ambient seismic noise tomography has increased drastically over the last 10 years. And over the last three or so years, we've been using this method for, um, for seismic mineral exploration. And today I'll show three of those examples that we applied on different scales. I'll start off with uh, a regional or tenement wide, uh, tenement scale exploration study that we conducted conducted in the eastern midlands of Tasmania. Here we deployed more than 140 geophones in a thousand square kilometer area, roughly the size of a, a, a exploration tenement. <coughs> uh, we recorded data for one month and um, the interest in this region was to image to create um, higher resolution images of the Tamar fracture system. The Tamar Fracture System is a low velocity region that extends from Lance System down to the Tasman Peninsula. And the reason for the interest in this region is because in some parts of the Tamar Fracture System, there have been anomalous surface heat flow measurements taken. So it clearly indicates the potential for ge a geothermal resource in this region. But in order for us to know what the depth and the possible extent of this resource is, we need better or higher resolution images. The array took only three days to deploy. Um, for two teams, and that's because the array was planned to follow um, roads. And even though regions like this one, where we don't have any geofronts deployed, because this is a ray based method, this is one of the regions where we have the highest resolution since there are many crossing rays in this, in this region. The results of the study showed firstly that we can see the north south extent of the Tamar fracture system. This is the western edge of the Tamar fracture system. And we can also see several of the mapped faults in the region 
aligning with some of these low, some of these velocity contrasts. The promising aspect from the study was that uh, this highly fractured zone of the thermal fracture system, this low velocity zone here indicated by the velocity anomaly, um, dips to the east and extends down to eight kilometer depth. So starting around two kilometers down to eight kilometer depth um, and perforates into the, the granitic basement. So this clearly indicates a, a great potential for geothermal energy because of this highly permeable um, zone of granite. And even though this is a geothermal application, uh, some modern uh, geothermal energy producing systems also are able to extract, extract minerals from, from the fluids that are used to circulate. So and as we know, in metasomatized granite, there's a, a large potential for several minerals. So this is a very promising new um, field where geothermal energy can be produced from these um, from these uh, permeable granite zones, but it can also produce minerals that can be used to store and, and transport this energy. The second study I want to show is a study we did with Oz Minerals in South Australia as part of the Advanced Discovery Initiative. And here we deployed roughly 230 uh, nodal geophones in, in a 50 square kilometer area with 500 meter spacing between nodes. And the goals of this survey was to see if ambient noise tomography can accelerate the discovery undercover. The, the sub goals, if you will, were to determine a depth of cover for improved gravity corrections, to, to image the extent and orientation of the major structures in the region, and to directly image high velocity anomalies in the basement that could serve as targets for, for, for drilling. The first part of the study was successfully um, achieved where we imaged the depth of the sedimentary cover. We can see in this in the study area the depth below surface or so the, the depth of cover varies between 550 and 750 meters and there's a northwest trending uh, paleo channel in this region, with several um, depressions in the paleo topography and um, several, several um, peaks in the paleo topography. And all of these um, variations in the paleo topography cause artificial um, anomalies in the gravity if not correctly accounted for. The second part of the study was to identify the, the major structures in the region. Um, to investigate this here, we look at the uh, depth section at 800 meters. So this is within the or within the granitic basement. And what we see is the orientation of the major structures here indicated by velocity contrast between high velocities and low velocities. So we see this northeast trending structure, some smaller displays of the structure, and then also a northwest trending structure. Some of these structures are also visible in the first vertical derivative of the total magnetic density, such as this northeast trending structure we can see here and this northwest trending structure. But here you can see the power of the method where we can not only delineate these structure with much greater resolution, but also determine at what depths and, and how deep they extend. Then the final part of the survey was to directly image the high velocity anomalies in the basement. The reason why we were interested in high velocity anomalies in the basement here is because we have a pretty good idea of what the velocities are of iron oxides, such as magnetite and hematite, compared to granite. And we can see here that the iron oxides are, are, are considerably faster than the granitic host. And therefore, in these regions where we see high velocity anomalies are quite have certainly have a quite a high probability of being iron oxides. Some of these larger anomalies, such as the one in the southeast, have also a corresponding uh, gravity anomaly with it, although this is the residual gravity before uh, cover corrections have been made. So here you can see the possibility for this method to directly detect um, ore deposits at depth and to really indicate the size and the extent of some of these um, gravity anomalies that are present in the study area. The final study that I want to show is a, a brownfield study that we conducted in a gold mine in Western Australia. The fascinating part of this study is that it was a multi-scale imaging project where we used the nodal seismic geophones at surface, roughly 200 of these. 
um, but we also use the existing underground seismic monitoring network that's used to monitor mining and induced seismicity and some deep exploration um, sensors, which were uh, oral sensors, which were placed in deep exploration holes below the current workings. So with the surface array here, we used ambient noise tomography as we have before to, and the goal was to image the regional shear. And the underground stations were used with mining induced seismicity and blasts to, and, and travel time tomography to create a, a try and image some of the, the important structures for mineralization below the current workings. The resulting images showed some very interesting features. Firstly, we could see the football contact of this regional shear quite clearly. We also could um, see the depth of the cup sedimentary cover. And in the underground array, we could see what looked to be the alteration pipes that supply the hydrothermal fluid for mineralization. You can see these, these rectilinear structures. So this method showed quite nicely that how you can supplement an existing underground network that's used for monitoring seismicity for safety purposes to also turn into an imaging array for near mine exploration. So in conclusion, um, passive seismic imaging is a new method for, that geophysicists can use for mineral exploration. It's a very low cost, a very low environmental footprint method, and it excels in remote regions um, where other geophysics might struggle. And most importantly, it can image undercover, where especially potential field methods can struggle. So we are sure that there will still be many applications of this method in various um, exploration programs at different scales and from different commodities. But there are also several interesting improvements or uh, refinements to the methods coming in the next few years. Several of these are methodological. So for instance, in the Pacific project, we're investigating the extraction of body waves. Here we can see P and S waves um, in ambient seismic noise. And this will improve the resolution of our method so that we can image smaller structures with greater detail. Another methodological advance is the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence to jointly interpret these disparate data sets. For instance, if we wanted to jointly um, interpret a high resolution 3D seismic velocity volume with uh, magnetic um, survey data and drilling, there's no constitutive relationship between the three parameters, but machine learning and artificial intelligence could potentially find the links between these and, and improve our understanding and interpretation of these different data sets. And then finally, there are also several uh, technological advances to look forward to. For instance, we are working uh, with several companies on uh, general or on, on manufacturing real time nodes so that we can from the first moment that we install these sensors, generate and build up an image of the subsurface without the, the, the lag time of uh, retrieving the data and harvesting the data. So in future, we wish to use real-time seismic stations and cloud computing to generate 3D seismic models. We're also working with DAS, which is a new sensing method called distributed acoustic sensing. And here we plan or here we encourage our customers to before they seal up deep exploration holes to throw a fiber cable down before they grab the hole. And in future, we can hook up a DAS interrogator to image below the current workings to create high resolution images and also to reduce the amount of drilling required. So I'd like to thank um, Andrew Foley from Goldfields who's been an early supporter of this work and continues to be very enthusiastic about this work. I'd also like to thank all my colleagues at IMS for contributing to this, these studies that I showed today. And also like to thank Rul Schneider from the Colorado School of Mines for all his comments and feedbacks on, on the presentation. Then I'd like to thank the crew from Oz Minerals, Mike Sloan, Andrew Thompson, Mitch Newman, Andrew McCulloch, and Ian Anderson, who've been very supportive of this work and um, given great feedback and suggestions for improving the methods. I, I, I look forward to continuing working with them. Also like to thank Mark Dufford and Daniel Bombalieri from Mineral Resources Tasmania. Um, who helped with the, uh, collaborated with us on the Eastern Midlands projects in Tasmania <coughs> and also helped with the field work. And similarly, also to John Bishop from Spark Energy. 
Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank Oz Minerals, Goldfields and Mineral Resources Tasmania for not only um, supporting this work, but also um, encouraging us to show this work at this conference. So that's more or less all I wanted to sh share with you today. If you have any questions or comments about this work, please feel free to get in touch with me on LinkedIn or on uh, my email, which is you can find in this presentation. And um, with that, I'll sign off and say goodbye. Thanks.